Hi, news nerds. In this video, we're going to talk about beta blockers. So let's just go and get started. All right, so before we start talking about beta blockers, I really want us to understand just the basic autonomic nervous system physiology, primarily focusing on the beta receptors, beta 1 and beta 2. Okay, because a lot of the beta blockers that we're going to talk about, some of them are very selective. They only bind to beta 1. Some are non-selective, so they can bind to beta 1 and beta 2. And then there's one other group that we'll talk about, a third generation, consisting of labetalol and carvedilol, that they can bind to alpha and beta receptors. Okay, but we're primarily going to focus on the beta receptors in this point here. So beta receptors, they can be found on multiple different target organs. The ones that we're going to focus on are here. And what I want you guys to remember is that we're going to talk about how the sympathetic nervous system works on these target organs during a fight or flight situation. So during a fight or flight mode, what basic like gray matter structure inside of the central nervous system, particularly within the diencephalon, is stimulated? It's the hypothalamus, right? When the hypothalamus is stimulated, it sends these descending action potentials down through the spinal cord, through the brainstem, through the spinal cord, to these preganglionic motor neurons located within the thoracolumbar portion of the spinal cord, particularly T1 to L2. It stimulates these preganglionic motor neurons in T1 to L2 and sends that outflow. And if you guys really want to be particular here, technically it goes out and synapses on a postganglionic motor neuron, right? The cell body's there, and then those postganglionic motor neurons will then go to the effector organs, or target organs. Well, let's think about some of the organs that it affects. Let's start with the top. We look at the eyes. What do we know that it does to the eyes? If you guys remember, it works particularly on the ciliary processes, right? And the ciliary body. And the overall effect here is that it actually causes an increase in aqueous humor production which is that fluid that fills within the anterior uh, segment of the eye, right? And the other thing that it can do is it can actually cause pupillary dilation. What is that called? What's the special fancy word for that? It's called madriasis. So it can cause pupillary dilation. And also, if you guys really want to know, it can make, uh, it can control the effects of the ciliary muscles, which can accommodate the lens in a specific way for distant or far vision. Now, the next thing that we have to talk about is that this can act on beta receptors on the heart, right? Particularly the ones that I want you to know are the beta-1 receptors. And these are located on the conduction system as well as located on the contractile cells. Now, when epinephrine and norepinephrine are released onto these beta-1 receptors here, if it works on the conduction system, like the SA node, the AV node, what's the overall effect? It's going to increase the heart rate. And you know, if you increase heart rate, you technically increase cardiac output and therefore increase blood pressure. If we affect the contractile myocardial cells, we're going to increase the calcium loading into those, right? We'll increase calcium loading into those contractile myocardial cells and increase the strength of the contraction through that sarcomere unit. If we increase contractility, what does that do? So you increase contraction. If you increase contraction, you increase stroke volume. If you increase stroke volume, you increase blood pressure, right? If you increase heart rate, you increase cardiac output. And if you increase cardiac output, you increase blood pressure. And if we really want to be specific here, technically, an increase in stroke volume will actually increase cardiac output, and then that will increase blood pressure, right? Either way, we're increasing blood pressure. Why are we increasing blood pressure? Because in a fight or flight situation, we want good perfusion to those tissues like the muscles in the brain. Simple thought there, right? What else? There's also beta-1 receptors that are present here in the JG cells of the kidney. You know the juxtaglomerular cells? They respond to epinephrine and norepinephrine. And whenever they're released onto those beta-1 cells, they release renin. Renin, if you guys remember, eventually leads to converting angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. And then angiotensin 1 is converted through what's called ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, into angiotensin 2. And through multiple different mechanisms, the overall goal here is that angiotensin 2 increases blood pressure through vasoconstriction, through increasing the uh, aldosterone production, which causes more sodium and water retention, increasing ADH production, which increases water retention. The overall goal, though, is increased BP. Okay? So again, that plays a role in perfusion.
Let's go down to the next one, the lungs. These are actually beta two receptors. And again, I didn't put up here, I should actually go back up here for a second. Technically, if we look here on the eyeball, the ciliary body is controlled by beta two receptors and the pupil is actually controlled by alpha one receptors. If you guys really wanted to know that. Okay, since we were mentioning the receptors here. But again, we're primarily gonna focus on the beta, okay? So beta two primarily, I want you to remember, regulates accommodation of the pupil, as well as also regulates the aqueous humor production. If you really want to, the alpha one does control pupillary dilation. All right, we go back to the lungs. There's beta two receptors on the lungs, particularly in the bronchial smooth muscle. Whenever epinephrine and norepinephrine act on this, what does it do? It causes bronchodilation. And if you cause bronchodilation, what's the overall effect? The overall effect is that you could potentially increase ventilation. And if you increase ventilation, what does that do? That increases oxygen supply. And if you increase oxygen supply, you increase the oxygen delivery to the tissues. And we need that oxygen because it helps to make ATP. ATP is good for muscle contraction as well as important for action potentials within the central nervous system. Pretty simple stuff, right? Let's go to the next thing. Not only do we need oxygen and good perfusion, but we need energy. We need glucose as well. So there's also beta-2 receptors on the liver cells and beta-2 receptors on what's called the pancreatic alpha cells. So I'm actually going to put here alpha cells. When epinephrine or epinephrine act on the liver beta-2 receptors, it increases glucose through two primary mechanisms. I'm just going to tell you that it's gluconeogenesis, right? Gluconeogenesis is the formation of glucose molecules through non-carbohydrate sources. The second way is glycogenolysis, which is the breakdown of glycogen into glucose. Either way, we're going to increase those blood glucose levels. If it acts on the beta-2 receptors on the pancreatic alpha cells, who does that stimulate? That stimulates what's called glucagon. And you guys know that glucagon works on the liver, right? And how does it work on the liver? Well, it stimulates the liver to make more glucose. How? Through gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Pretty cool stuff, right? So that's one way. We increase the glucose. We increase that uh, ability to perform uh, anaerobic and aerobic respiration to make ATP. Pretty cool stuff. What about on the, particularly the blood vessels? Now remember, we're talking primarily about beta receptors. We're talking about beta. There is beta two adrenergic receptors that are present on the vascular smooth muscle that's supplying the brain as well as the muscle. So these two primarily. Well, I'm gonna tell you one of the things about the adipose tissue in a second. So if we act on the beta two receptors, remember, what do I want? I want good perfusion as well as oxygen and nutrients to be delivered to the brain and the skeletal muscle. So what I'm gonna do is, is in order to increase blood flow to these two organs, all right, if I wanna increase blood flow or perfusion, what do I have to do to these vessels? I gotta vasodilate them. So the overall effect is vasodilation to increase perfusion or blood flow into the capillary structures that are supplying these two organs and therefore give them more blood, more oxygen, more nutrients, and therefore the ability to perform better. There's something else that's really cool though. In the capillary endothelium, the beta adrenergic receptors can activate capillary endothelial cells to increase the expression of an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. Let me write that down. It's called lipoprotein lipase. What this enzyme does is, is you have triglycerides flowing through the bloodstream, right? These triglycerides, and actually triglycerides can be found in what's called chylomicrons if you really wanna be specific, but just for the simplicity here, triglycerides are broken down via lipoprotein lipase into what's called free fatty acids. And if you really wanna remember, it's also glycerol. Now, what happens is these free fatty acids are another nutrient source to what tissues? These free fatty acids can actually be delivered to our skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle because now we're giving it more fuel to produce tons of ATP for energy. As well as some of this also can lead to free fatty acids being taken up by the adipose cells as well, okay? All right, so now we know that there's vasodilation to increase perfusion as well as activation of lipoprotein lipase enzymes to break down triglycerides into free fatty acids and glycerol to deliver more energy to the muscle tissue. What about the GI tract? There's beta-2 receptors that are found on the gastric smooth muscle. Not the sphincters, the gastric smooth muscle. Now, if we talk about this, sympathetic nervous system, do you wanna be digesting food? 
ex uh, expending energy for that kind of activity in a fight or flight situation. No. So let's decrease a lot of the energy going into contraction of smooth muscle and motility as well as secretions. And by doing that, we can divert a lot of that energy as well as blood flow to other more needed tissues like the brain and the muscles. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And by doing that, we decrease GI motility and we decrease a lot of the secretions. Okay, now before we move on to now talking about how beta blockers work in the next diagram, I want us to have an idea of how these adrenergic system work on the beta one receptors that are present on the heart. Okay, and the reason why we're primarily focusing on the beta-1 receptors on the heart cells is because a lot of beta blockers that we're prescribing are primarily used for cardiovascular diseases. And we'll talk about those indications later. But we're gonna focus on two cells. One is we're gonna talk about a pacemaker cell, which is basically like your AV node, your SA node, your Purkinje system. And then we're gonna talk about the non-pacemakers, which are basically the contractile cells. These are the ones that if we were to kind of draw it here, they would have that sarcomere like structure, right? With all the myosin and actin filaments as well. Okay. So these are the ones that produce contraction. These are the ones that generate action potentials. If you guys remember super briefly, whenever a pacemaker cell wants to generate an action potential on its own intrinsically, what channels are literally open a little bit? These are called funny sodium channels. We'll put F here for funny sodium channels. These allow for a little bit of sodium to trickle in. Now, net, normally, resting membrane potential is pretty, ne it's negative, maybe negative 90 millivolts, somewhere around there, right? As we bring in this sodium, we bring positive ions into the cell. What happens to that resting membrane potential? It starts becoming less negative. Maybe, let's just say, we're making up numbers here, but just for simplicity's sake, maybe it goes up to negative 70 millivolts. As it does that, that potential is high enough to open up another voltage gated channel. And these voltage-gated channels are T-type calcium channels. And they allow for calcium to also trickle in. And as calcium trickles in, we bring in more positive charge. Maybe we go up, let's just say, maybe we go up to negative 40 millivolts. Okay? We're becoming more positive as we bring in more cations. As that happens, these more positive ions actually stimulate another voltage-gated calcium channel, a really important one. And this one is called the L-type calcium channels. And they allow for calcium to flow in and to bring that actual membrane potential from negative 40, maybe bring it all the way up to like plus 10 or something. So they really flip that membrane potential. This creates a depolarization of this cell. And then when it depolarizes, it helps to allow for some of those cations to flow from other pacemaker cells as well as to contractile cells through these specific structural units called gap junctions. And technically, there's gap junctions and little proteins that anchor the cells together called desmosomes, which make up intercalated discs. Now, once these cations start flowing in to this actual non-pacemaker cell or contractile cell, what happens? It brings maybe resting membrane potential. Let's just use the same number, negative millivolt, 90 millivolts. By having this, it brings it up. Let's just say it brings it up to negative 70 millivolts. That might be just enough to activate these voltage gated sodium channels and allow for sodium to rush into the cell. As sodium rushes into the cell through these fast sodium channels, the inside of the cell starts to become extremely positive. Maybe it goes all the way to like plus 10 millivolts. What happens then is once we hit plus 10 millivolts, this channel shuts down and potassium channels open and allow for potassium to start leaking out. Now the cell membrane now, if we're having positive ions leave the cell, what's happening to the inside of the cell membrane now? Now the charge might be becoming more negative. Maybe it drops to zero millivolts. Around anywhere between zero to positive 10 millivolts, this calcium channel, this L-type calcium channel is very sensitive to that voltage and it opens. And when it opens, it allows for calcium to flow into this actual muscle cell and stimulate this little endoplasmic reticulum structure, which has specific types of ryanidine receptors on it. And that causes calcium to come exploding out of this sarcoplasmic reticulum 
into the sarcoplasm. Where does that calcium go? To the actual sarcomere and induces muscle contraction. So how does this adrenergic system work to affect this pacemaker cell? Remember I told you it increases heart rate, right? Well, what happens is through a long process, right? It basically helps to activate a G protein, which activates adenylate cyclase, converts ATP to cyclic AMP and activates what's called protein kinase A. And that protein kinase A phosphorylates these proteins on these L-type calcium channels and opens up the channel. Now more calcium can flow in. If more calcium can flow into this pacemaker cell, it generates action potentials much, much quicker. And if the action potentials are occurring quickly and more uh, at a faster rate, what happens to the overall rate of that conduction? It increases. Therefore, if increased conduction rate, there's an increase in heart rate. Same way, epinephrine, norepinephrine bind onto the beta-1 adrenergic receptors on the contractile cells or the non-pacemaker cells. What do they do? It activates, again, G stimulatory protein converts the ATP, uh, activates G stimulatory, which activates adenylate cyclase, which converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP eventually leads to protein kinase A. When I activate protein kinase A, guess what this guy does? Phosphorylates these L type calcium channels. If I load this myocardial cell with more calcium, it's going to stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release more calcium. More calcium in the sarcoplasm means more contraction. More contraction, you increase the intensity of the contraction, and therefore, there's an increase in contractility. Simple concept, right? So now that we've talked about this, we can now understand exactly how these beta blockers work. All right, so now that we've pretty much laid the groundwork for how the beta receptors play a role in all these different target organs, all we got to do is just block every effect. So remember what it did on the beta-2 receptors? Remember, primarily beta-2. I know we did say that there was alpha-1 on that, basically the iris muscle, but I want us to focus on beta-2. Remember, it, the, it caused madriasis, right, which was through the alpha-1. But for the beta-2 on the ciliary processes, it increased aqueous humor production. If we block that, we're going to decrease aqueous humor. If you decrease aqueous humor, what does that do to the intraocular pressure? It decreases intraocular pressure. You'll see that there are certain drugs that actually can do that. Beta blockers like Timolol that we use for people who have high intraocular pressure. And what kind of conditions? Glaucoma. We'll talk about that. All right. It acts on the beta-1 receptors that are on the conduction system and the beta-1 receptors that are present on the ventricular myocardium. If we block what this, these receptors, remember, it used to increase heart rate and increase contractility. Well, if we block it, we're going to decrease heart rate and we're gonna decrease contractility. And that has multiple effects. One of the big effects that I want you to remember out of this is that if you decrease heart rate and contractility, are you using as much oxygen to supply that myocardium now? No. So it's not having to work so hard all the darn time. So if you're not having it work so hard all the time, it's oxygen demand starts to decrease and that's important. And also, if we decrease oxygen demand, that's important in conditions like heart failure. That's important in conditions where people have myocardial infarctions after that effect, or if they just have coronary artery disease, angina pectoris. And here's another thing. If we drop high, high, uh, heart rate and contractility, we drop blood pressure. So this is also good in patients who have hypertension. And if you decrease heart rate by d blocking that AV node, guess what else you can do? You can decrease the actual conduction effects in patients who have what's called arrhythmias. We'll talk about that. Next thing, if you inhibit the JG cells, the beta-1 receptors on the JG cells, you decrease renin production. If you decrease renin production, you decrease angiotensin 1 production and decrease angiotensin 2 production. What does that do? That decreases blood pressure. Through what way? Inhibiting the vasoconstrictive mechanisms, inhibiting aldosterone and ADH production. If you inhibit aldosterone and ADH production, you don't reabsorb a lot of sodium and water. You instead excrete that out of the body. Second thing is you're not causing vasoconstriction, so the pressure is going to start dropping because there's not as much resistance of the vessels. Pretty cool. All right. What about in the lungs? Well, remember it caused bronchodilation. If we block that on the beta-2 receptors, especially if we use non-selective beta blockers, they can bind onto these beta-2 receptors. And if what does it normally cause? Bronchodilation. What's the opposite of that? Bronchospasm. So it can lead to bronchoconstriction, 
and that bronchoconstriction could lead to a potential spasm of the bronchi, which is not good if somebody has an underlying COPD or asthma. Okay, now let's block the beta-2 receptors that are present on the liver cells, as well as the beta-2 receptors present on the pancreatic alpha cells. Remember what this eventually did? It caused glucose production, right, through gluconeogenesis. This led to glucagon production from the pancreatic alpha cells, which stimulated glucose production, right, through gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. If we inhibit glucagon production, we inhibit glucose production through gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, and if we inhibit the liver cells, we decrease glucose production. This is important, especially if someone has what's called diabetes. We'll talk about what's called hypoglycemia unawareness. Next thing, what about the beta-2 receptors that are present on the vascular smooth muscles supplying the brain and the skeletal muscles, as well as cardiac muscle? Primarily skeletal, though. If you block this, it caused vasodilation. What's the opposite of vasodilation? Vasoconstriction. But here's the key thing I want you to remember. It's mild vasoconstriction. It's not that severe where it's gonna significantly alter the pressure going to these tissues. There's a mild vasoconstriction. So because of that, there's a minor drop or bump in the blood flow to these tissues, okay? As well as if you block the capillary endothelium from expressing the production of what's called lipoprotein, decreasing the expression of lipoprotein, lipase, what does that mean? Remember triglycerides that were found within the chylomicrons or VLDLs, that's gonna have less conversion into what's called free fatty acids. So if you inhibit this process, you can't break down the triglycerides. So what happens to the triglyceride content? It goes up. <laughs> Makes sense, right? All right, what about the beta-2 receptors that are present on the, on the actual gastric smooth muscle, the one that plays a role in peristalsis and segmentation and things like that? Well, if you inhibit this, you're actually gonna have the opposite effect. It usually decreases GI motility. So what's the opposite of that? Increase in GI motility. So there's a moderate bump in GI motility that may be responsible for a little bit of diarrhea, maybe a little bit of increase in secretions as well. Okay, now that we've understand all of that, let's look at how these beta blockers affect the inside of the cell. Common questions that come up on like board exams is how they affect particular phases. So if you guys just a basic diagram here, let's say here on the y-axis you have millivolts, here on the x-axis is milliseconds. You guys might remember this kind of graph here. It might look familiar, right? This is basically the conduction potential through the pacemaker cells. And if you remember, there was different phases to this, right? So you have phase four, phase zero, you have um, phase three, okay? Now, phase four is basically where these funny channels are open, and it's also where those T-type calcium channels are open, and just a little bit towards the end, as you approach this what's called threshold potential, as you approach that, these L-type calcium channels start slowly opening and allowing calcium ions to leak in, just a little bit. Remember what I told you with basically how epinephrine and norepinephrine act on these beta-1 receptors? Remember what they did eventually? They increased protein kinase A production, which was designed to stimulate those L-type calcium channels and increase calcium influx. Well, what if we inhibit this? If we inhibit it by giving a beta blocker, we block the effect of it on this beta-1 receptor, we effectively do what to the protein kinase A production? We decrease it. If we decrease that, we decrease the stimulation of the L-type calcium channels. If you decrease calcium loading into the cell, that's gonna decrease the conduction potential. And if you decrease that conduction potential, it's gonna slow down that heart rate. We already talked about that, right? But in what phase does it primarily affect? You're gonna notice that it actually slows phase four and phase zero, because zero is also where this L-type calcium is flowing in very powerfully. So it slows phase four and phase zero. It's a common question on your boards. The other thing is again, remember here in the non-pacemaker cells, here's millivolts on the y-axis, milliseconds on the x-axis. Here we have resting membrane potential. Here's threshold potential. Let's say here's your peak potential. Remember it starts off kind of flat, 
then it starts to rise up, drops down, plateaus, and then drops down again. Here, if we look at this one, you have a bunch of different phases here, right? There's phase four, there's phase zero, there's phase one, and phase two, and phase three here, right? Now, phase four is basically where the cell is repolarizing, okay? Potassium is leaking out of the cell. But then phase zero is when these sodium channels are open and they blast in and increase the action potentials on the sarcolemma that leads to the activation of these calcium channels eventually, right? The L-type calcium channels. Remember what happened before. As sodium influxed in, we went up to peak potential, maybe positive 10 millivolts. Remember that channel that opened up on the cell membrane around positive 10 millivolts? It was the potassium channels. And when potassium leaked out, what happened to that membrane potential? Remember we said we, we made up a number went from plus zero to about z, uh, plus 10 to zero millivolts. Then what happened as you drop down? It stimulated the calcium channels and the calcium flew in, stimulated the ryanodine receptors, which were on the sarcoplasmic reticulum that led to calcium release, which led to contraction right? Well, phase two is when the calcium is rushing in and where potassium is exiting. Guess where the beta blockers primarily work? Remember, they decrease protein kinase A because they block the effect on that receptor. If you decrease protein kinase A, you inhibit the activity of the L-type calcium channels. Where do the L-type calcium channels primarily occur in? Phase two, because remember, phase one is when the potassium is leaving Phase two is when calcium is coming in and potassium is going out. If we inhibit this, there's less calcium coming into the cell, less stimulation of the ryanodine receptors, less calcium release, and less contractility, right? So what phase does it primarily affect? It slows phase two. And again, this is in the non-pacemaker cells and then slows phase four and phase zero in the pacemaker cells. All right, so now we've talked about the physiology of the actual beta receptors. We've talked about how beta blockers work mechanistically at the overall organ view level and the cellular level, right? Now what I wanna do is I wanna mention the different types of beta blockers, but we have to be specific on the category that they belong to. So three main ones, first generation, second generation, third generation. Why are they different, okay? First generation, what I want you to remember is that these are non-specific, okay? So these are non-selective beta blockers. So what does that mean? That means that these beta blockers that we're gonna mention here can bind onto beta one, or it could bind onto beta two, okay? So it could bind onto both of them, all right? What are some of these first generation beta blockers? Some of these are gonna be things like Temelol, and interestingly or not, this one is actually used to treat glaucoma. You can put that on topically or ophthalmic wise. Another one is called propanolol, also brand name Enderol. And another one is going to be called Sotolol. So again, these kinds of beta blockers you can give for multiple different reasons. And we'll talk about the reasons for beta blockers in general. And then we'll mention a couple that are a little bit more specific to certain kinds of conditions. But again, if you give these, the overall thing that you have to remember is that they can bind to beta one and they can bind to beta two. So because of that, they might have some of the side effects because of the beta two effect. Like what? Bronchospasm, okay? They might also drop your glucose, which can lead to hypoglycemia unawareness. And we'll talk about some of the other side effects. The second generation blockers, these ones are selective, okay? These are selective. What does that mean? They only particularly bind to beta one. But I need to make sure that we make a little disclaimer here. These, yes, these second generations primarily are beta one, but there is notices on these drugs that say at higher concentrations, they do have the capability to bind on to beta two receptors. So yes, they are primarily beta one, but at higher concentrations of the drug, they do have the potential to bind onto beta two receptors. What are some of these drugs? Well, atenolol is one. Ace butolol is another. Um, bisoprolol. Um, esmolol. And a very common one, metoprolol. These are a lot of your second generation beta blockers. And again, these are going to be more for beta one, which means where are they going to primarily act? 
heart and kidney. So what are their primary functions? We're going to see here in a little bit that they're primarily going to be helping with hypertension, uh, supraventricular tachycardias, maybe heart failure after someone's had an MI, things like that. Okay. The last one that I want to mention here is your third generation beta blockers. What is the difference with these? These are also non-selective, but we have to be a little bit more specific because the first generation was also non-selective. These can bind onto beta one, they can bind onto beta two, and they can also bind onto alpha one receptors. Remember what alpha one receptors do with the vascular smooth muscle? They cause vasoconstriction, right? Whenever they're stimulated by epinephrine and norepinephrine. If you give these kinds of beta blockers like carvedilol and labetalol, they block the alpha one receptor. So basically what normally is vasoconstriction, if you block that will lead to vasodilation. What's the overall effect of dropping um, vasodilation? It drops the resistance and therefore drops the pressure and decreases afterload on the heart as well, right? So what are these kinds of drugs? These are things like labetalol as well as carvedilol. Another actual nice thing to know about these, especially labetalol, labetalol is commonly given during hypertensive emergencies. So whenever somebody has blood pressure that is, according to the AHA, greater than uh, 180 systolic over 120 diastolic with end organ damage, we commonly give labetalol, it's like a drip. Um, carvedilol... Carvedilol is actually going to be a little bit specific in the sense that you can give this, especially in patients who have heart failure or hypertension, because it actually has antioxidant properties. So what it can do is it can actually decrease reactive oxygen species. And by doing that, remember reactive oxygen species play a role within the oxidation of the LDL particles, and that plays a role in atherosclerosis. Technically, you can decrease atherosclerosis with this and therefore help with patients who have heart failure or hypertension. That's a pretty cool thing. Another thing I wanna make sure for labetalol, not just for the hypertensive emergencies, but it's also safe in pregnancy, okay? So it's not teratogenic, which is nice, all right? So again, these are the things I want you guys to remember. First generation, second generation, third generation, big overarching view. First generation is non-selective for beta one, beta two. Second generation, selective for beta-1, but at high concentrations, it can't act on beta-2. And lastly, third generation is non-selective for beta-1, beta-2, but also has alpha-1 antagonistic activity as well. Okay, now let's move on to the indications. All right, so the next thing we got to talk about is the indications of these beta blockers. Well, we've kind of already done that a little bit, right? Remember what it did to the heart? It decreased oxygen demand within tissues because it's dropping the heart rate and the contractility, so it's not consuming as much oxygen. What would that be good for? What kind of conditions where you basically need a lot of oxygen to be delivered to the tissues and you dropping the demands a little bit helps with that kind of situation? What if there's ischemia to the heart? What if somebody has an underlying coronary artery disease? That could be a reason. So if someone has CAD, whether that CAD be due to um, having a myocardial infarction previously or whether it be due to angina pectoris, right? Chest pain. What else would it be good for? Well, another thing that you have to think about is that not only are you uh, decreasing oxygen demands and therefore decreasing the ischemic pains as from coronary artery disease, but also remember it slows down the heart rate. And if we slow down that heart rate by either decreasing the SA node action potentials or blocking conduction at the AV node, we can potentially decrease a lot of those arrhythmias that are originating in the atria, like AFib and a flutter. So we can also treat tachycardias, particularly atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, right? And again, that's because we're decreasing the heart rate, blocking the AV node or decreasing conduction, um, conduction potentials, right? The next thing also, if you're also inhibiting the inotropic action, right? Decreasing contractility of the heart, that technically can help in particularly situations where the blood pressure is really high. Because technically, if you decrease heart rate and you decrease the contractility, the overall effect is a drop in blood pressure. So this could be good in patients with underlying hypertension. The other thing which is also really helpful for, and again, there is some controversy on this, but it can be helpful by decreasing the oxygen demand right? And also by helping to decrease a lot of the um, preload on the heart, 
Uh, particularly, beta blockers can help in conditions like heart failure, as long as they are not decompensated. So these are also good for heart failure, but just make sure that you remember there is controversial evidence saying that not in decompensated heart failure. Okay. The next thing that we also have to talk about here is it can also be used in situations like protecting the heart whenever there is uh, maybe an aortic dissection. So if patients have what's called an aortic dissection, it's also important for that because if you decrease the blood pressure, right, you're technically going to be decreasing the action uh, decreasing a lot of that tearing forces through the actual tunica media, right? So it's going to decrease the risk of actually having that um, aortic dissection getting worse. So it's good for treating aortic dissections that don't need to be treated surgically at this point in time, and we can try to manage medically. Same thing with someone who has an aortic aneurysm. If someone has an aortic aneurysm, obviously if we continue to allow for that pressure to be high, it's going to continue to keep exerting excessive forces on that blood vessel wall, which can potentially produce a rupturing of that aortic aneurysm, which can lead to exsanguination and therefore hypovolemic shock and death. So we can also try to control uh, aortic aneurysms as well. The other thing that's also important for is that we can also use this in situations where someone has an arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, we can use it to rate control them at that point in time, or we can use it for prophylaxis for SVT. So it can also be used for SVT prophylaxis. So basically, if someone has an AFib atrial flutter exacerbation, we can rate control them at this point in time if they come into the ER, we can rate control them with a beta blocker, but then long term, we can put them on a beta blocker to prevent them from developing another atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter exacerbation. Okay. Next thing we have to talk about besides the heart is its effect on the vascular system. Remember, we talked about two particular drugs, two particular drugs that are going to be important here, right? One of the big ones here is labetalol, right? So we know labetalol is going to be acting here at the actual vascular smooth muscle, because remember, it can act at the beta receptors as well as the alpha-1 receptors here on the vascular smooth muscle, the precapillary sphincters. If it works here, what's the overall effect? If you basically inhibit vasoconstriction, what does that allow for? That allows for vasodilation and increased blood flow. But also, if you decrease the vasoconstriction mechanisms, it'll decrease the total peripheral resistance proximal to this, which will help to decrease afterload on the heart. So labetalol is really good for helping with these kinds of situations when people have high blood pressure by reducing the total peripheral resistance. That one as well as carvedilol, okay? So that is important. So I want you guys to remember it can help uh, labetalol and carvedilol can help with uh, particularly uh, systolic hypertension that is caused by increased resistance, right, from the adrenergic system. If we block those alpha-1 receptors, then we can allow for that decrease in total peripheral resistance, decreasing the blood pressure and afterload. Here's the thing that you got to remember. These kinds of drugs, except for maybe labetalol and carvedilol, regardless though, you shouldn't really do this. If, we, if you're giving a drug like a beta blocker, a primary beta blocker that doesn't have an alpha blocker activity, if someone comes in and they have what's called um, a, uh, they're, they're using cocaine or they have what's called a pheochromocytoma, which is where they produce a lot of epinephrine, norepinephrine. It is a contraindication to give beta blockers. Why? Let's make sense of this. You have an alpha one receptor here, but guess what else? Sometimes you'll have what's called beta receptors, right? So you can have beta receptors over here. If you're using beta blockers, what are they doing? They're blocking the beta receptors, right? So if I give a beta blocker, it's blocking the beta receptor. So that means that epinephrine and norepinephrine can't bind to that beta receptor. Where can they now bind then? They can come over here and bind onto the alpha-1 receptor because they don't have to bind onto the beta receptor. They can't. Now a lot of their concentration is being drawn towards that alpha-1 receptor. If it binds to that alpha-1 receptor, what happens to that now? It increases... It causes vasoconstriction, which increases the total peripheral resistance and increases the blood pressure even more, leading to worse situations. 
So the basic idea is you never give beta blockers. Do not, no beta blockers for these patients with cocaine use or pheochromocytoma because there's what's called unopposed alpha-1 uh, agonism, okay? And so because of that, you can't actually block that alpha-1 receptor because you're actually uh, having so much beta blockade that the epinephrine and norepinephrine are finding another receptor site, the alpha-1 receptor, causing increased phases of constriction, increased total peripheral resistance, increasing the blood pressure, which might even lead to an aortic dissection because now the blood pressure is out of control. So you see what's a contraindication. Other things that these beta blockers can be used for, especially propanolol, is it can be used for anxiety. You guys know basically that whenever the sympathetic nervous system is activated, a lot of some of the symptoms that the patient can develop is physical symptoms of anxiety, palpitation, chest tightness, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, things like that, right? So if we can give specific drugs, we can inhibit the sympathetic nervous system to decrease a lot of those physical symptoms. A common one that's given for this is propanolol. Okay, so we can also use it for in the treatment of anxiety, particularly like panic attacks. Another one is you can use it for migraine prophylaxis. They believe it does this by regulating the blood flow through the central nervous system, right? Because if you give a beta blocker, that technically can cause a little bit of vasoconstriction of the blood flow going to the brain, and that can help with basically that the migraines that people can get related to that blood flow. And again, this would be propanolol. They also see that that one's helpful. Another thing is that you guys know there's beta-2 receptors on what's called the muscle spindles, right? And whenever epinephrine and norepinephrine bind onto these muscle spindles, they increase the contraction of the muscle spindles, which increases the action potentials, right, through these sensory receptors, and therefore increases the efferent potential through the motor fibers. And what happens as a result of this is that you can get tremors. So whenever there's the sympathetic nervous system activity, it can increase muscle spindle activity that can lead to tremors. If we give a beta blocker, we block the effect of epi and norepi on these beta-2 receptors, therefore blocking tremors. Who is that important in? People who have essential tremors. So we can also use some of these beta blockers against what's called essential tremors. And again, this would be something like propanolol. The other thing, you guys remember that there was these beta-2 receptors on the ciliary body and ciliary processes. Remember, they help to play a role with aqueous humor production. Well, if I have someone who has a lot of aqueous humor, which is leading to high intraocular pressure because so much of that fluid is building up within the anterior segment, or particularly the anterior chamber of the anterior segment, that can cause a lot of pain, right? That's called glaucoma. So if we give someone a drug like Timolol, that's going to inhibit that beta-2 receptor. That'll decrease, decrease, decrease aqueous human production and decrease intraocular pressure. So this is also a drug that can be used in glaucoma. Okay, so again, remember Timolol particularly for glaucoma. So the last condition that I want you guys to remember is thyrotoxicosis, okay, which is called thyroid storm, right? And so basically with this condition, there's an increase in thyroid hormone. And if you guys remember, if there's an increase in thyroid hormone, it increases the receptor sensitivity of the sympathetic nervous system, right? So it increases the activity on beta-1 receptors and on alpha-1 receptors. So if we give a drug that can block the activity of that increased sympathetic nervous system activity on beta-1 and adrenergic receptors, we're going to help within situations where someone has thyrotoxicosis. Obviously, if they have thyrotoxicosis, you have to treat other underlying symptoms, drop their fever, give them fluids, and again, you might have to give them something like propanolol uh, or another type of beta blocker to try to drop that pressure, drop the heart rate, and also basically just control a lot of their other symptoms as well. Okay, so again, that's the indications of beta blockers. All right, so side effects, pretty simple. We've already gone over a lot of this stuff. It should make true sense. Again, you give a beta blocker, right? They're gonna block the actual AV conduction. Potentially, if you give too much of a beta blocker, what could that do? It could block the AV node enough that it leads to potentially a heart block. So there is the potential of leading to a heart block. Maybe prolonging that PR interval, maybe potentially leading to a second degree heart block. We don't know, it depends upon how much of that beta blocker you give, as well as 
another drug interaction, never give a beta blocker with a calcium channel blocker. Why? Because you double blockade that AV node. And if you double blockade that, you're going to lead to a severe heart block. The patient will become presyncopal or syncopal, and that's not something we want. Obviously, with any antihypertensive drug, if you're using too much of it, there is the potential of hypotension. So that's another side effect that you also have to watch out for. Another thing to watch out for, especially with labetalol or carbetalol, because they act on those alpha-1 receptors and they block it, they could potentially lead to orthostasis. So I'm just going to write a little note in here, orthostasis for third gen, okay, beta blockers. So don't forget that. Last thing here on the lungs here, right? It also acts on those beta-2 receptors, the non-selective type, but even the selective at higher concentrations. If it acts on those beta-2 receptors and blocks it, which normally causes bronchodilation, you can get bronchoconstriction. That bronchospasm is not good whenever someone has an underlying disease. It could even be potentially contraindicated in patients with asthma or COPD because it could exacerbate it even more and it could make it worse. So we don't want to give patients beta blockers who have severe asthma or COPD, all right? What about activity on the GI tract? Well, remember what the sympathetic nervous system does. It decreases GI motility. If we block that, we're technically going to lead to an increase in GI motility, and an increase in GI motility could potentially produce diarrhea, okay? Also, we block that lipoprotein lipase enzyme. We decrease its expression. If you decrease that, you decrease triglyceride into free fatty acid conversion. So if you decrease free fatty acids and increase triglyceride, what will happen when you need to do a lipid panel? They're going to be like me, and they're going to have high triglycerides. Okay? The other thing, if you give a beta block, remember, they act on those beta-2 receptors that supply blood to the muscle tissue and to the brain tissue. If you block that beta-2 receptor, which causes vasodilation, you're going to get vasoconstriction. And therefore, there'll be a slight drop in blood flow to that muscle. What can happen with that? It can lead to fatigue because you're not getting enough energy to the muscles. So there's a potential of fatigue. Another thing you have to be aware of is that it acts in the central nervous system, right? There's sympathetic activity in the central nervous system. Okay, usually it's a part of your fight or flight system. If you blunt that sometimes, it can lead to potentially nightmares and also maybe even insomnia. They've even shown it in certain situations where it can even maybe be a cause of sexual dysfunction or ED. Last thing, big, big, big one. It can lead to what's called hypoglycemia unawareness. Simple concept here, right? When someone's diabetic, whether they have a decrease in insulin or they have insulin resistance, right? One or the other. What's the overall effect? that they can have, what? Increased blood glucose levels, right? Because they're not able to take that glucose into the cells. Over time, as a result, that high glucose levels lead to polyuria and lead to excessive amounts of urine, which is high in glucose and high in water. Eventually, that will lead to hypoglycemia, okay? If someone develops hypoglycemia, how does the body react? Whenever there's hypoglycemia, it's supposed to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is supposed to cause particular symptoms that make the patient aware that they're low in their blood sugar. Like what? Maybe they start having tremors. Maybe they start having palpitations. Maybe they start sweating because the sympathetic nervous system does that. Maybe they start getting a little bit anxious. Maybe they actually start having a little bit of confusion, right? So those are some of the sympathetic nervous system signs. But if we give a beta blocker which blocks that activity, are they going to be aware of those symptoms? Like increasing heart rate, palpitations, diaphoresis, um, tremors? No. And so because of that, they can be unaware that their glucose levels are actually low and they could go into a potential coma. So that's something that we don't want. And that's something we got to be careful of when we give beta blockers in patients with diabetes. Last but not least, if you give someone too much of a beta blocker and they start exhibiting symptoms of any of these things, heart blocks, hypoglycemia, unawareness, what can we do? Well, first thing is give them tons of fluids. So start off by giving lots of fluids and you can do two drugs, atropine. Why? Because atropine is a acetylcholine receptor antagonist. So it's basically going to 
block the acetylcholine effect at the receptor site, which at the heart, it's gonna actually oppose acetylcholine, which tries to drop that heart rate and blood pressure. So therefore, if we block the acetylcholine effect, we technically are gonna lead to an increase in heart rate, increase in blood pressure. So we're trying to oppose all the effects of that beta blockade. So we can give atropine. The other one is glucagon. Okay, because glucagon, it also helps to be able to override the effects of this beta blocker, block, uh, beta blockade, all right? So again, antidote in situations where there's high beta block act activity, fluid, atropine, and glucagon, okay? All right, engineers, so in this video, we talked about beta blockers. I hope this video made sense. I hope you guys really did enjoy it. If you guys did stick out there at the entire time of this video, we can't thank you guys enough. You guys are awesome, greatest fans in the world. Also, if you guys get a chance, down in the description box, we have links to our Facebook, Instagram, Patreon account. Go check those out. Make sure you hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. All right, engineers, as always, until next time. Thank you.